1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1 through chapter 5, verse 21. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. When Ishbosheth, son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost courage, and all Israel became alarmed. And remember, Ishbosheth was a moral and spiritual weakling. The only thing that kept his kingdom together was Abner, the now deceased military leader. That's why the population is panicked. There is a power vacuum in the north. No one is driving. It's panic time for the people. Verse 2. Now Saul's son had two men who were leaders of raiding bands. One was named Baana the other recap. They were the sons of Rimon, the Beer Rothite, from the tribe of Benjamin. Beeroth is considered a part of Benjamin. And so these two northern men, men who were involved in Ishbosheth's kingdom, they know there's a power vacuum, they know their king is weak, and they plan on filling that vacuum. The king is weak, the people are in a panic, and they will make a move for control. You know, guys like this, they pick up on people's weaknesses. And they are slick enough to offer a form of stability to them, but it's all about them. They take advantage of people in their weak condition. 4. Jonathan, (coughs) excuse me, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but he hurried she hurried but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled, and his name was Mephibosheth. That's a sad story. This little guy's nurse meant well, but she dropped him and he had a permanent injury because of it. And remember, his dad is Jonathan, and he is the deceased son of Saul, and Jonathan was a good man, David's best friend. So he had this little boy who never could walk, and now this little boy is about 12 years old. 5. Now Rechab and Baana, the sons of Rimon, the Beer Rothite, set out for the house of Ishbosheth, and they arrived there <coughs> in the heat of the day while he was taking his noonday rest. These two brothers knew exactly what they were doing here. They arrived at the hottest time of the day when they knew the king would be taking his nap. They knew their enemy, and that would help them defeat him. And that's why Satan has so much success. The reason Satan has so much success in getting people to sin is that he knows his enemies. He knows what buttons to push in an individual's life to get them to sin. And the only way those buttons do not work is if the people are walking in the spirit that he can push he close to Jesus. He can push those buttons all day and they won't work then. 6. They went into the inner part of the house as if to get some wheat and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and his brother Baana slipped away. These two brothers, they go into the house pretend they're going to get wheat. No one suspected anything was wrong when they did that because you know, that was normal for commanders to go wheat for their, get wheat for their men. But they used the wheat as a deception to get to the king and kill him. It looked normal, but that's the nature of a deception. The nature of a deception is that it sounds good, it looks good. That's why Jesus said we are to watch out that no one deceives us. We have to be on our guard because deceptions look good. The best thing we can do is just stay close to God and be on the alert for things that people say or do that just do not quite make sense when you compare it with Scripture. 7. They had gone into the house while he was lying on the bed in his bedroom. After they stabbed him and killed them, killed him, they cut off his head, taken it with them, and they traveled all night by way of the Arabah. So they gained access to the king through deceit, and they got away in the darkness. They used deceit and darkness 
because what they did was evil. If a person has to use deceit, then what they are doing is not of God. This is I mean, the cults are classic cases of this. The cults will deceive people. They use the same vocabulary but a different dictionary as the Orthodox Christianity, and they know it, but they're trying to draw people in through deception. Verse 8. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy, who tried to take your life. This day the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, against Saul and his offspring. Notice how these two men piously sprinkle the name of God upon their cold-blooded murder. But a godly person like David sees right through that kind of spiritual trash. He's not going to buy it. Godly people are impressed by holiness, not pious words. They are not impressed when some moral reprobate sprinkles a little God or the Lord or the good Lord into their conversation. Doesn't doesn't impress them at all. 9. David answered Rechab and his brother Baana, the sons of Rimon, the Berothite, as surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of all trouble. David says, God has delivered me out of all trouble. He makes it clear he didn't want their sinful favors. He didn't even need their sinful favors. God says, or David says, God has delivered me out of all my troubles. And God did not need the help of cold-blooded killers to deliver David the kingdom. He has delivered David from his troubles in the past as David continued to walk with him and wait patiently for God to move. Verse 10. When a man told me Saul is dead and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. That was the reward I gave him for it for his news. The man who told David that he had killed King Saul, remember, and thought he would get a reward for that, was wrong. Instead, David executed him for killing the Lord's anointed. And the same thing is going to happen right here. Look at verse 11. How much more, when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed, should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? And so instead of a reward, these two men got a death sentence. They were evil men, guilty of murder. And David, whose head could not be turned with flattery or by favors done in an ungodly way, is going to hold them accountable. 12. So David gave an order to his men, and they killed them. They cut off their hands and their feet and hung the bodies by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. People who were convicted of treason back in those days were executed, mutilated, and put on public display. Kind of gruesome, but it worked pretty good to deter future criminals, I'll tell you that much. Chapter 5 All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. Well, the northern tribes of Israel, they have lost their king, Ishbosheth, he's dead. Their commanding officer, Abner, he's dead. They have no one left to lead. If they don't do something, their kingdom will probably splinter into several little pieces or else simply be conquered by the Philistines. So that's why they call on David to be their king. Verse 2. In the past, while Saul was king over us, You were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. A leader will lead whether he's an official leader or not. It just comes naturally. And that's what David had been doing. Even while Saul was king, that's what David was doing. A person cannot read a book and learn ten principles of leadership and just magically become a leader. It doesn't work that way. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Walk in the will of God. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak and live the Word of God with boldness. And you'll lead. And those who are called to follow, they will follow. It's that simple. Verse 3. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, 
the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. And this was done before the Lord, meaning David would swear to lead under the lordship of Almighty God, and the people would agree to the terms of God's law and walk in the law of God. That is what is meant when it says that they made this agreement before the Lord. As long as David and the people keep a God focus, they will experience God's blessing. And that's true of any relationship. In order for any relationship to experience God's best, all involved need to keep a God focus. The moment that focus is is broken, there's going to be strife. 4. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. Saul, David's predecessor, reigned 40 years. David reigned 40 years. Later on, David's son Solomon will reign 40 years also. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The thing that God promised David 17 years earlier has now come to pass. It is God's time, and David is ready to rule the whole country. God did not say, hey David, in 17 years, you're going to start your reign. So you can start checking off the days one at a time. He did not say that. God gave David his word. He said, you're going to be king. And then he expected David to occupy himself with holiness while he waited for that to come to pass. 6. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. The Canaanites who occupied Jerusalem were overconfident about being able to keep it. They said, we could defend our city with the blind and the lame and still be able to keep it from you, David. Confidence, I suppose, is good as long as it's in God. Overconfidence and arrogance against what you're just asking for trouble. Verse 7. Love this. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. God says, nevertheless, David captured the city. God just yawned at the boasting of the Canaanites. When God hears people say how they are going to do things their way and not his way. The Bible says that he who is enthroned in heaven laughs. He yawns at the boasting of people. Verse 8. On that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. And so, notice, their arrogant remark about defending the city with the lame and the blind did not intimidate David one bit. He has heard boasting like that before. From the big guy, Goliath. It didn't matter then, and it doesn't matter here. David just kept a God focus, followed the plan. The best thing to do is to keep a God focus and prayerfully come up with a plan and prayerfully follow it, no matter what it involves. Verse 9. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up an area around it from the supporting terraces inward. And he became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. Things are really starting to click for David now. He is growing in power and he has the kingdom. Like Psalm 1 says, he's like the tree that is planted by the rivers of water. He is bringing forth fruit in its season. And when we walk with God, he's going to take us to heights that we otherwise would not attain to. It may take a while, and it may not be physical in nature, but it'll happen, and we'll see the fruits of it for sure in eternity. 11. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stone masons. And they built a palace for David. Now, Hiram was a good guy. He was always willing to work with King David and later on with David's son Solomon. Hiram needed agricultural products for his people, and Israel needed skilled builders and building materials, so they made the trade. 
Hiram was not one of God's people, but David worked with him. And it's good, if it's possible, to get along with non-Christians, best we can. It's certainly not good to act superior to them, but it's good to be a spiritual light in their presence. Twelve. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. David knew that God was the one who made him king. And he also knew that God didn't do it to build up David's self-esteem. God did it for the sake of his people Israel, the Bible says. Like Christians today. God's purpose for David and God's purpose for being, or I should say David's purpose for being, was not to make a name for himself. But God calls and anoints and gifts his people to glorify him and to be a blessing to others. 13. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. And I'm not going to read all these names in 14, 15, and 16. Let me just say this. Kings had harems back in those days. That was not unusual. It was not acceptable to God, but it was socially acceptable. David did not seek God's will concerning extra wives. Either that or he didn't listen when God said no. All kings were doing it, but that didn't mean that David should. And God's people are held to a higher standard of behavior in the world. And that is part of the cost that Jesus tells us to count before we choose to become a Christian. 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel... They went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines had been pretty much leaving David alone recently. But that all changes now that they hear how strong he is. He's just taken over the whole kingdom. And they're probably intimidated. And they figure they're going to have to squash him while they still possibly might be able to do it. It's sort of like having a baby tiger for a pet. You better get rid of it fast. Before it gets too big, or it may end up having you for launch. Well, the Philistines are about to attack. Same old story. We'll pick it up here.